architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash and you are yet once again listening to Architecture Talk. And today, like the weeks before and hopefully many weeks to come, we will try to have a conversation with a contemporary thinker on issues of architecture and architectural thinking with the idea, with the concept, with the hope and desire to advance the frontier of that thinking. Today I am talking to Dr. Rajesh P. N. Rao. He is the CGA and Elizabeth Huang Professor of Computer Science and Engineering and the co-director of the NSF Center for Neurotechnology here at the University of Washington. He has won a lot of awards. He works in a wide range of topics. But he is most famous for a series of experiments and labs that he has set up investigating brain computer interfacing. Yes, he claims to be able to change things, to do things in the world simply by thinking about them. This piqued my interest, so I thought we should talk to Professor Rao and see what his thinking might have to teach us about architecture. Here we go. Welcome to Architecture Talk. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. I mean, in some ways, you are at the... I mean, the interesting thing about you is, on the one hand, you are a, you're a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> I accept that quite graciously. Okay. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. you're a weird computer engineering uh -huh. type. Right. And in yeah. that sense, you are at the... Uh, you know, you're you're an, or you're an artificial intelligence man, right? right. And and you're and natural, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and and natural, and right. you're doing natural intelligence. Yes. You're doing the brain, combining and, them, and yes. combining brain with robotics, yes. and you're gonna mm. be talking about humanoid computers uh -huh. and teaching computers as if they were they were our kids and how kids <laughs> learn. Some computers can learn, and then you know soon we'll be teaching our kids the way computers learn. <laughs> It's, it's they already the, are. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the kind of electronics, the gadgets they're used to now. Uh, I know, I yeah, know, I right, know. And the right. iPad and the iPhone yes. is probably teaching them. To, oh, to essentially swipe at every surface that they see, right? And, and to think that way. <laughs> yes, the world works by swiping. The <laughs> world works by swiping. And, you know, you have to be able to do this to yes, the world. Yes, yes. I mean, that's actually where we kind of come into this conversation about, yeah. uh, you know, interfaces and tools. So yeah, yeah. a lot of what we do, uh, especially this brain-computer interface, you can yeah. sort of look at that as the uh, culmination of tools that we've created for ourselves, you know, right. uh, in, in the sense that, you know, at the very early stages, we had, you know, rock tools, right? We had stones sure, that we were carving sure. into. And we were actually augmenting ourselves uh, through these kinds of uh, uh, inventions that we made. Uh, all the way up to now, you know, we've augmented how we transport ourselves with uh, No, we have always so been augmenting ourselves. Yes, exactly. It's just nothing new, except now it's augmenting the brain, which, you know, uh, is, you know is taking Which is a, a quantum leap. It is. If it's successful, yeah, it could be, right? In terms of evolution of humanity itself, right? It's uh, uh, it's it's quite an interesting way to look at um, how we progressed over the ages in terms of Steve Jobs ourselves. used to call the computer the bicycle for the brain. <laughs> <laughs> but what uh, you're talking about is way beyond that. So yes. you, Dr. Rajesh Rao, is talking about yeah. you know how, you know building an interface for the brain in the sense that for thinking. You are building devices where I can think, just think, mm -hmm. and make changes in the world. Yes. I saw yes. you had an NPR thing where there was this reporter who came and right. uh, was week, able yes. to communicate uh, mm -hmm. with somebody else in another room simply by thinking. Uh, to, yeah, in a, in a very rudimentary sense. A rudimentary yes, sense, yes, of course, with yes. electrons attached. Yes, to a, yes, it wasn't to, telepathy <laughs> it uh, wasn't in, in telepath that sense, but it was computer-assisted, you know, telepathy, if you want to call it that. Well, like, sooner uh, or later, you'll just yeah. make it wireless, and then you'll call it <laughs> telepathy. 
<laughs> sure, yeah. So the, the, the motivation for a lot of that came uh, through, you know, helping people who are paralyzed and uh, who cannot communicate. So, for example, people with ALS, uh, yeah, you know, okay. uh, Stephen Hawking yeah. had that disease. Um, yeah. So I think a lot of the uh, field is focused on uh, building communication devices for people who are completely paralyzed or who might benefit, you know, from stroke, for example, if they can benefit from communication or control of devices because they cannot control their own body, yeah, yeah, yeah. but they can control, you know, a prosthetic hand or an amp uh, like a um, robotic hand or even a robotic wheelchair, for example, for mobility. But that's just a starting um, point. That's Rajesh. just a starting point for I mean, that's just, uh, that's just an yes. excuse. I mean, so. <laughs> Come on. You, you got right to the point, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. So I think it's a very important point to make now because uh, the field is really, you know, um, I think it's it's taken off already, right? Yeah. So uh, what we're doing at our center, the Center for Neurotechnology here at the yeah. University of Washington, is yeah. addressing exactly that uh, aspect of it, which is, you know, what if you go beyond the realm of rehabilitation and restoration of function to augmentation yeah. of human function? Yeah. Uh, what are the ethics of that, right? So neuroethics is a very uh, a a core area field. of, and we are actually leaders in the field here at the University of Washington. So really? we have our, uh, our thrust leaders yeah. are actually from philosophy. Yeah, so yeah. We have philosophers. So Sarah Gehring is a professor here in philosophy. She's part of our center yeah, yeah, yeah. for neurotechnology. And we're looking at all those issues. So we're doing studies of people that have implants in their brains for Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, and we're asking them how it's changed their personality. You know, uh, we've talk, we're talking about agency. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. these devices can alter, you know, uh, how you perceive yourself and you know, who's in control when you have a device interacting with your brain. So there's a lot of really important issues that come through. And you can also ask their, their family, right? So the, the caregivers and their spouses might say, this person has changed sure. after they've been implanted with this device, which was supposed to be helping them with you know, the motor function, right? Yeah. Uh, preventing tremors, for example, but it might also have some other effects which were not intended, right? So we're exploring all of those. I mean, it's issues. like the artificial leg discussion with uh, Amy Mullins. Yes, yes. I mean, with her legs, the yes. sort of, uh, she can run faster than anybody. Exactly, exactly, yep, exactly. So you're yeah. making your sort of brain enhancement uh, yes. devices. You can think about that, right? You can think about, okay, what does it mean to, uh, you know, augment different aspects of your, um, you know, not just physical capacities, which is something we can do now with robotics and so on, but yeah. also your mental capacities, mental right? Capacities. So memories, Well, that's what a computer uh, is. It's a yeah, in a sense, we're using uh, computers for that, right? Memory, we're using it for uh, information, so just accessing information. Uh, you no longer have to store it all in, inside your skull, right? It's actually out there, but you can access it using yeah. Yeah. these devices that we have, right? right? But then, you know, you can ask, like, what does it mean for the future, right, of, of humanity itself? Like, how, do we, how are we actually going to judge intelligence, right? Okay, 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 Rajesh. Yeah. I don't know anything about this. No, but, some things. But, yeah, I know <laughs> something, but I have heard time and again, uh -huh. beware artificial intelligence. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Plenty of people are yes. sounding the alarm. Yes, so that's uh, artificial intelligence, which is machines that can think for themselves. Yes. And what we're doing here at the, uh, you know, at my research yes. is trying to combine, you know, the benefits of artificial intelligence for hum human intelligence, right? right? So that's the merger of artificial and human intelligence. And so you can think of it as one way of saying, okay, how, how do we make sure that humans are integral part of that loop where you're actually interacting with it, but you're not, you know, uh, the AI is not exactly, you know, going on its own and doing bad things, right? If that's what you're afraid of, um, you can sort of think of it so as... So you think your, your uh, work is a check on unbridled uh, Some AI? people think that. I mean, I, no, I, actually, you? I actually think AI by itself, where it is now, yeah. is we are nowhere near that kind of a threat, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. that it's a threat to humanity's existence. But do you think it's a threat? But uh, if it's done, I mean, if, if it is done in an uncontrolled way, yeah. then sometime in the future, potentially could be. I don't think we can rule that out. What's the threat? The threat is that it might cause, uh, you know, um, it might cause destruction in a way that uh, perhaps, you know, uh, humans might not cause. So mm -hmm. it might be. So the whole goal with, of AI is mm -hmm. optimizing a particular, uh, you know, function. Right. right. So and they t tend to be very narrow. Yeah. So right now the AI might be something that tries to find faces in your photographs, yeah, 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 yeah. and that works really well, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's a very narrow uh, function it serves. Right. But now, if it if you imagine that as being another uh, you know AI that yeah. is also optimizing a very narrow function that the human engineer gave it, yeah. But the only way to optimize or the best way to optimize that function, yeah, 
is actually causing harm to right. another human. It's that safety pin, uh, the clip example. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, there's many examples of in Hollywood, right? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah, there's yeah. this AI that's trying to help, you yeah. know, one particular yeah. kind. Black of, Mirror. Know, yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. If you look at Black Mirror, all the, uh, many of the episodes are based on that. Right, right. So the danger, I think, is in terms of us engineering AI, so, uh, you know, computer scientists engineering AI that are very narrowly focused, that work great for a particular purpose. But if the, uh, uh, if the AI is only thinking in a very narrow way and doesn't have human values uh, or cultural values attached yeah. to it, then there is a danger in the future that it might be uh, optimizing at the detriment of you know, humans uh, that are not in its own you know, kind of optimization field of view. Okay, right? so that's we're talking about autonomous AI, kind of running uh, on its own. It's autonomous to the extent that it's allowed to take certain actions, and those actions in some way could potentially harm humans. Right, that's where the danger comes. Okay. If it's only an AI that's you know recognizing faces in an image, I mean there are some privacy issues. Obviously, it could it could, but it wouldn't it could it wouldn't be able to physically harm a human unless it has the capacity to do so. Right? So you are you are you are sort of doing a merger, a sort of a marriage. Yes. Between so we, brain thinking. Yes. And let's say AI thinking. That's one way to look at it. Is that you know uh, we're trying to. Um, have humanity or humans actually uh, sort of co-evolve in a sense, right, with whatever the advances are, where we are You're we're going to evolve us? Yes, we are, we are actually evolving ourselves in uh -huh. some sense. I mean, we're already doing that with smartphones right, and the right, internet, right, right, right? Right, 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 right. And this is basically another tool to let us, um, you know, understand that. How is that really going to help us as humans? Okay, right? what's your tool? Yeah. Describe to us this, the, you, the things you put on our head. Right. What, what are you building? Just dumb layman's description sure, sure. of what you make. Yeah, so think of it as you know a device that can uh, extract information from the brain, and mm -hmm. you can do that in different ways. You yeah. can do it completely non-invasively through a cap, yeah. which is what we use in our lab. Yeah. Uh, no surgery required. Yeah. Um, there's another way which would be to actually open the skull, put a, a layer of wires on top of the brain itself. Yeah, yeah. We do that in the hospital, yeah. but that's only for patients who come in for brain surgery, yeah, yeah. for epilepsy, for example. And finally, you do that? yeah, we, uh, I mean, I don't do that, but uh, my collaborators yeah. uh, do in the, yeah. in the hospital, like in yeah. Harborview and yeah. in, uh, you know, Seattle Children's, for example. Uh -huh. uh, so these are all medical, yeah. you know, treatments, yeah. right? Uh, but they are, they are implanted on the surface of the brain. Right. Uh, and then there's some patients, a few of them around the world, actually, uh, not here in Seattle, but in, in some of our collaborators' lab uh, in other places where they implant a, these uh, wires inside the brain itself, right? Wow. Um, and we do that here only for patients who have a medical need for that. For example, if they have tremors, so yeah. like essential tremor or Parkinson's disease, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's called deep brain stimulation. I see. So that case, you're sending electrical pulses as a pacemaker directly yeah, yeah. into a deep structure in the brain. Okay. So that's also an example of an interface, but right. that's not reading or extracting signals. It's writing or it's sending information into the brain or pulses into the brain. Right. right? Now, if you look at it in a big picture sense, the whole device, yeah. you can call that a brain computer interface or a brain machine interface. Right. And the idea there is it can extract information from the brain right. and it can send information back to the brain. Okay. And so you can close the loop. But what it's doing is in between, it's actually doing something useful for the brain, right? So it could be sending that information to control a cursor yeah. on a computer screen where you can write an email okay. uh, to your loved ones. If you cannot say things because you're paralyzed, right, right. you can use it to write an email. So okay. that's an example of a brain-computer interface. Right, right. Uh, you could also, for example, control a robotic hand that mm -hmm. goes and picks up you know, a cup for you for, to feed yourself. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. people have shown that. Uh, a woman you know, who was paralyzed for many years was mm -hmm. able to finally after many years, she, for the first time, she was able to pick up a cup of coffee or a bottle of coffee and then feed herself. Okay. Um, and she did that only by using her brain signals. Right, right? So right, the computer right. extracted that signal mm -hmm. uh, and then parsed it uh, okay. by using AI, you know, machine learning techniques. Mm -hmm. So it was trained for many days to mm -hmm. understand her brain signals. Right. And then it used it to move the, the robotic hand up and down, left and right, and then finally grasp mm -hmm. a cup and then bring it to her mouth and she was able to drink, okay. right, from a straw. So um, you're telling me my brain generates signals yes. that are, uh, let's say, indexed to what I'm thinking? Yes. So, for example, right now, as you lifted your hand and yeah. you gestured, yeah. your brain generated those particular patterns uh, yeah. from, uh, you know, the motor cortex is an area that sends those patterns of signals to the muscles yeah, yeah. through the spinal cord. It's controlling the muscles of your you know, forearm and yeah, your yeah. 
uh, hand, yeah. and that in turn caused your hand to you know move in a particular way. Yeah, yeah. But if you know, if I'm given access to that particular area of your brain and I'm reading those signals also simultaneously, okay. simultaneously, uh, then I can form a correlation between okay, here's your hand movement. And here's what the brain pattern looks like. But those signals are traveling down the spinal cord, and, right? It's generated first in the brain. Right. And then it travels down the spinal cord, and then yeah. information comes back to your brain again from touching. Suppose you yeah, touch yeah. a cup, yeah. it's going to send information back, yeah. right? So your brain is both sending and receiving information all the time. So how can you target so exactly where in the brain it's, it's sending down a signal, pick up that coffee cup? Well, so interestingly, the brain is organized in a very um, you know, systematic manner in terms of different locations on your brain, different yeah. areas yeah. are controlling uh, or receiving different uh, kinds of information. So for example, there's an area that uh, we can identify that is called the motor cortex mm -hmm. that uh, controls, for example, movement yeah. across the body. Yeah. Right? Now within that area, we can go a little bit deeper and we, we can then for example, um, you know, every time you move your hand, we can record from many areas and see which one lights up or gets more yeah. active. Okay. And we can do a mapping. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. We can also send little pulses of electricity and see is it causing your hand to twitch. And what do you mean right. lights up? Uh, it increases in activity. So these are cells. increases in activity. Yes, electrical impulses. Electrical impulses across so, the synapses. Uh, across the you know the yeah, you can look at it as across synapses, or mm. even if you're recording from a single cell or a group of cells. Yeah. Uh, then when there's an increase in the uh, electrical pulses that that area is sending to control your muscles. So uh, we can everything that. works by electrical pulses? It's electrical chemical. So electrical uh, chemical. the synapses are actually you know, chemical. Yeah, right? yeah. In many, most cases there's a uh, chemical, but the communication long distance yeah. from the brain to the spinal cord and spinal yeah. cord to the muscles are electrical. That's electrical. And, yeah, and they're done to electrical pulses, like yeah. a zero or one kind of binary really? signal. And, uh, and it needs to be binary because, you know, it's the, the brain's, uh, the, the nervous system has found a way to send these in a very fast way. You yeah, know, yeah. Uh, sort so of it jumping has to from, go at the speed of light. It zooms really low, actually, compared to the speed of light. It does? Uh, it is? Yeah, it is much slower. So there's a speed? There's a speed, yeah. It's, What's uh, the speed at which a signal goes from uh, it's my a few, brain? Uh, so it's basically, you know, the, the, the transmission from one synapse to another. Mm -hmm. uh, it's usually in the millisecond time scale, so a couple of milliseconds. But, so how much time uh, did it take from my brain to my fingertip? It might be a few, uh, you know, anywhere from if, uh, if it's a reflex, for example, a few tens of milliseconds, it could be about uh, 200, 300 milliseconds, yeah. right, that, that you have this traveling uh, signal from your brain to, you know. So there's different uh, speeds depending All on whether the pathways are myelinated or not. Yeah. Um, so some of them are, you know, they, they have these special kind of uh, hardware yeah. that, that zooms this, this electrical pulse down that pathway, yeah. but others don't have that, so it depends. So there are some highways uh, and there's, some there's, high, the, there's yeah, exactly. the mall road also. Exactly, you can sort of think of that, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, in that way right um, but, okay but yeah so I think the key uh, is that we all have uh, some uniformity yeah, in yeah which parts of our brain you know control which parts of our body right, and right. which parts receive information so the visual system is receiving information from the back of the head is a visual cortex yeah, uh, yeah. Is, is what receives a lot of the information then propagates that information towards the center of your brain and yeah. then once you cross the center line it becomes more motor so it's yeah. all the parts that plan yeah. you know what you're going to do during the day and there's yeah. some hierarchical structures there that says okay yeah. today I'm going to do x y and z and then you break it down and yeah. then by the time it comes to the motor cortex yeah. it's gone to the level of moving individual fingers yeah, or yeah. moving your legs and so on the right? motor cortex is where it's it's, uh, it's in the ba it's in the very top of okay. your uh, uh, skull, so okay. it's uh, it's uh, right at the center line, near the center line of the skull, okay. towards the front part of your brain. Okay. Um, and you know the back part tends to be uh, sensory, so that's more you know you can have a visual uh, uh, perception being received from the retina. Yeah. Uh, and then as you get towards the side of your brain, you start to see also auditory. So during the near the ears, yeah. you know, that part yeah. is where you get initially the the auditory information from your ears. Okay. Um, and then as you go towards the top part of your brain, the the sensation from your skin, right? You have so there's a very nice mapping. So um, where where in the brain do I think philosophy? Yes. So thinking is interesting because you know uh, it's a it's it's I mean it's a word that means you're you're uh, you know, it's an abstract word. It's not like a very specific mapping yeah. from, you know, muscle, uh, yeah. from brain to muscle or yeah. from skin. Uh, so it involves a lot of portions of the brain. So when you're thinking, you might be imagining, yeah. you know, going through a particular, you know, area of your house and yeah. so on. That might activate your visual system. Uh -huh. So the, the brain co-ops many of these systems to do things like thinking. So thinking is uh, all the systems sort of working in concordance? Yes. So it could be that you're shut off your, you, if, you're, if you're, for example, uh, you know, it's similar to dreaming, right? So you're kind mm -hmm. of using your system in a freewheeling kind of way to 
not enact those mm -hmm. actions, mm -hmm. but you're using it as a, as a simulator. So you're using your brain as a simulator. It's like a model of the world that mm -hmm. you've learned mm -hmm. right from the time you were born. Mm -hmm. uh, and that model is being used to uh, propose hypotheses of, okay, what happens if, you know, for example, uh, I do X or Y? Mm -hmm. And you can run that simulation in your mind, right, in your brain, by right. using many of the same circuits I see, that I you're see. using yeah. to do the actions. So writing cells. a novel is, uh, is running simulations, right? In some sense, yeah. Uh, so you could be... Or imagining the uh, film that I'm going to make, I'm running simulations. Yes. So that's but we the... use simulations all the time in daily life, right? Yes, I... which is why I think, uh, so I've worked in, uh, you know, this area of uh, computer modeling of the brain. So uh, we don't just build devices, but we also try to understand the brain because yeah, yeah. they both go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah. So one of the most, I think, um, uh, the, the sort of richest theories of the brain right now of how the brain works is that the brain is essentially, you know, it's, it's learning an internal model of the world. Mm. And one of the theories is that it's constantly trying to predict what, it, what it's about to receive. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. when there's a violation of that prediction, then that's uh, a novelty or surprise signal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the whole uh, game is always to, uh, whenever you see novelty, try to learn it and predict it and then suppress that novelty. Right, right, right. right. So uh, that's one of the reasons why, you know, um, you don't pay attention to things that, so once you're in this room, you've sort of figured out the room, you, you have a model of this room. Yeah. So you're not gonna notice anything unless, you know, there's something that falls off the wall yeah, or yeah, yeah. you hear a big bang, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's catches your attention yeah. because it's a novel phenomenon, right? Right. So it's a very interesting uh, theory um, of predictive brain, you know, uh, I worked a little bit on that, the predictive coding model of the cortex. Right, right. Um, and so that model, uh, it helps us to start to understand a lot of interesting uh, phenomena uh, in neuroscience and also, you know, phenomena that have to do with visual illusions. It's all about the brain learning a model right. of the world, no, no, but using I'm, it for predictions. But the simulation model that you yes. were talking about, I mean, that's architecture. Yes. You can we look are at it in as. the business of simulation making. Yes, and we have, we have that in our brains, right? I mean, we have a model. We simulate yes. built environments, Yes. and then we transfer them into readable documents uh -huh. that construction managers can make. Right, right, right. Right? Yes. This is core to our business. Exactly. And so, uh, in fact, I mean, I think the brain's already beat you to it, right? It's already, um, <laughs> it's already doing that, right? Right, uh, it's right. It's been right. doing that for we're, you know, yeah, we're millennia. Yeah, we have been using that, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's in the business of architecture but, but, in some sense. But it's sense. everywhere, yeah. you know? I'm yes. thinking of crossing the road. I yes. imagine myself yes. crossing the road. Exactly. Uh, yes. You know, and so on and so forth. Exactly, yeah. So I think you can, you can think of the brain as, you know, it can architect you know, thoughts, right? It can architect. What do you mean architect thoughts? It can, it can imagine situations that yes. you might never have been in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Because it My uses... brain does that all the time, my man. Exactly. <laughs> 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 Which is great. I mean, that's, I think, imagination is key to, you know, uh, yeah. creativity, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so the fact that we are creative as human beings, right, yeah. means that we have the capacity to use our model yeah. in, this, in, the, in, the, in the brain. So yeah. the cortex is a big part of it, the cerebral yeah. cortex, but there's yeah. also other structures. Yeah. Uh, we're using that as a way to uh, you know, try out different kinds of uh, scenarios. Oh, right? We are, yeah, yeah. So we are, we are, we know all about trying out. Mm -hmm. Now, before we go further deep into your technology, I want to, since you have brought up simulation, uh -huh. query you what you think of this whole new interest in psilocybin and uh, sort of mind altering, uh, 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 I suppose, dark drugs, mm -hmm. which make the brain see. Mm -hmm and feel like it is there in other kinds of consciousnesses. Right, well I, I guess since I have not personally experienced that, I'd yeah, probably yeah. not be uh, an expert in that, but I would say that uh, you know, the, the kinds of um, you know, effects that these drugs might have in the brain is essentially to uh, perturb some of these models that we might have learned mm -hmm. uh, during the course of our lives, yeah. such that it's, it's almost like you're, you're sort of uh, uh, shaking this, you know, uh, um, kind of uh, a model that you have up, and shaking it up in such a way that when it comes back to, uh, when it actually tries to settle down, mm -hmm. right, then you're in an uh, altered state, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. so, and that lets you potentially explore a whole alternate reality, right? So, and we um, call them genius in other places. When it's Van Gogh does it, right, right. <laughs> right. Or uh, it also happens, you know, when, for example, if you're really starving your brain of, you know, nutrients and so on, like for example, you're 
uh, you're actually uh, you know uh, not eating food for yeah, yeah. many many days. You're starving yourself. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Like the yogis. Yes, like the yogis. Right. Yes, yes, and then yes. suddenly you you feel okay. I have this vision. Yes, right. Like right? the Buddha sitting yes. in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, one theory is that a lot of it was brain starvation, right? So when you starve your brain, you're able to, I mean, your brain goes into this completely different state that might, uh, you know, the, the perception of, of, of that starved brain state might be this kind of altered reality, right? Um, we also see that with sleep deprivation. So that's a yeah. different kind of altered reality where mm. sleep deprivation will make you hallucinate. So this is the idea of the brain's constantly generating its own internal reality and matching it mm -hmm. with the external reality. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole this predictive coding idea. Mm -hmm. uh, but now if the, if, the, if the external reality is no longer modulating your internal you know creations yeah I mean, then um, your brain goes bizarre exactly that's it's like i'm free exactly so then you have those states right sometimes drugs make you go into that state sometimes it's lack of sleep oh. you start to hallucinate so hallucination is nothing but the brain being overly creative or overly imaginative right but you're a man of indian philosophy also it says here you're interested in indian art and 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 indescript yes. and, in, and probably read some indian philosophy it, the Indian philosophy says the external world is all Maya. Yes. It's all a hallucination. Yeah, I mean, so that's a very interesting, uh, you know, uh, concept, right? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, it kind of fits into this idea of, um, you know, um, a brain in a box kind of theory also, right? Which is that for all we know, everything could be a simulation. And yeah, we, we could be somebody. Exactly. <laughs> it's like the matrix, right? Yeah, so, it's the matrix, um, yeah. so that, so as far as the brain is concerned, I mean, the brain uh, inside our skulls, mm. uh, it doesn't care as long as it's receiving information that's correlated and, and makes sense in a statistical fashion, right? So it can create. That's a, right. A, a that's the matrix world. theory. Exactly. Yeah. yeah the so, brain would never know. Right. It would never know. Right. Yeah. So, so I think that part is what we're playing with in these devices that we're constructing. Is mm. you know we have uh, so the latest uh, paper that I published was on a neural coprocessor idea, which was the idea that the brain can have a coprocessor just as a computer can have a processor that mm -hmm. works with it. So you can yeah. augment the computer yeah. with additional coprocessors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the idea is you can now have uh, a coprocessor that is also built similar to the same uh, kind of uh, networks of you know neurons or brain yeah. cells that the brain has. You can yeah. build a computer model of it. You're making what, a digital brain. Yes, so you can sort of think of it as a digital brain, yeah. except it's 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 actually interacting with the brain uh, in an online fashion, right? So it's actually uh, receiving information from the brain, processing it, yeah. and then sending information back to the brain. So it's almost right. like you've added an additional brain area. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right? I need um, one, man, for <laughs> <laughs> mathematics. <laughs> but think about that, right? So if that really, so that's just a theory right now. Yeah. But if that happens to be uh, powerful enough, so they are talking then, about brain upgrades. Yeah. So, so, so think about then this question of consciousness. Yes. Right. Yes. So what happens now if uh, you're now using this device as another brain area mm -hmm. and it's constantly interacting with your natural brain mm -hmm. and over time maybe this artificial you know, brain is giving you more and more functionality. You're relying on it more and more because it lets you communicate with other people, with mm -hmm. other, mm -hmm. uh, you mm -hmm. know, across the Internet and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, what do, you, what do you mean to say, okay, wh what is you? And in that case, yes. right? And where's your, where's your consciousness? Where is, where is consciousness? Yes, Tell exactly. Me. Yeah. exactly. And that's something we don't know yet. We don't know what No, no, consciousness just in is. the brain. Where, do you, where is consciousness? We don't know. We don't know. I think we, we think that there are certain areas of the brain that are crucial for it. So, for example, the cortex and the, the prefrontal cortex, which... So, we're not there yet in terms of a product. But you're right. I mean, you never know, right? You never know if, what that breakthrough is going to be. Okay, now, but um, connect some dots here for me. You are CSE, you're computer science and engineering. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to be a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Everything you have described to me makes you look like a neurosurgeon oh. or a neuro <laughs> or a brain scientist, you know, who looks at the brain. Yes, yes. And puts probes in and tries to understand the brain. Yes. No, but Which we use, are you? Which are you? I'm both. So I'm a computational neuroscientist. So I did my PhD, as you said, in yeah. computer science and engineering. Yeah. Uh, but I did three years of uh, postdoctoral, you know, research mm -hmm. at the Salk Institute. Oh, yes, you were you know? at, oh, yeah, you so were at Salk. I was at Salk. Louis Kahn Salk Institute. Exactly, yeah. Yes. And it was a wonderful environment, yes. you know, beautiful architecture. What do you mean wonderful environment? It's supposed to be brilliant for scientists. Yes. <laughs> I think you are a scientist <laughs> and a good one, all because of architecture. Yes. All because of Louis Kahn. I think so. I think that was very, very instrumental in, in who I am today. So, and I keep going back there, right? You uh, do? So, yes, yes. Oh, you yeah, love it, huh? Every time that there's a conference, there, I definitely go back, yeah, yeah. visit the SOC. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, I even had one of those offices 
that you know was facing the ocean. Uh, oh, you did! Uh, you had one the of very, the best offices for the very last year of uh, you know. I think uh, I was a senior postdoc at that time, so uh, I was able to get one of those offices. It was beautiful. I mean, it was like a wonderful environment. Did um, it? Did it s stimulate your research? I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm it, sure it stimulated your brain. <laughs> Because architecture, yes. I mean, this is one question we have over here. Uh -huh. You know, how is architecture acting on you? Yes. yes. I mean, obviously, we want to make a chair, you know, that you can sit on or get enough yes. light here. Yeah. But that's such a rudimentary thing. Uh -huh. I mean, architecture is well beyond that. We we, we believe we sort of we act on yes. you in in intangible. Yes. We call intangible, but actually yes. neurobrainical ways. Yes. Yes. Yeah. In fact, I mean, uh, there seems to be uh, there's even an academy of neuroscience for architecture, right? I don't know if you heard of that. It's like no. ANFA. 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 Yeah, and I think they had a meeting at the Salk some time ago, and this academy for neuroscience and architecture, they're doing some interesting uh, research on. The connection between neuroscience and architecture. Really? And yes, I think uh, it's actually uh, really I think uh, interesting because if you think about it, you know, uh, I was mentioning these um, you know EEG caps that you can wear and we yeah, wear yeah. them in the lab. Imagine wearing that and entering a building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 being there for a while, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, you're actually going to get. Uh, you know, a sense of, you know, how does a person actually feel about being in this environment, yeah. right? Yeah. And you can do studies, right? Yeah. Maybe people are already doing it, I'm yeah. not aware of it, but you can do studies of, you know, what are the effects of, uh, you know, being in a particular environment. Yeah. Uh, you could even do a prototype in virtual reality. And there are right. now virtual reality headsets you can yes, get. Yes, 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 um, yeah. So you, and then you can be immersed in that environment. Yes, yeah, that's, so you're in yeah. the environment, but you also have EEG cap on. Right. So now you... So we know how what you think about it. Yes. Or yes. How do you feel about that? I mean, yeah. uh, uh, is it causing you some stress or not? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do those kinds of studies. Right. Uh, the only issue is right now these devices, I mean, we have mobile devices now, so yeah. you can have mobile headsets, like yeah. these uh, EEG caps. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, but they tend to be uh, not as robust to, you know, movement. So if you're jumping around or you're... Yeah, speaking, yeah, yeah. they're going to see those uh, signals in yeah. these uh, record devices. Right. But I think uh, measuring the brain, yeah. right, could be a very interesting uh, added dimension to architecture. Totally. Right. So you could totally. be uh, coming up with, um, you know, those kinds of because measures. we we are we are producing, you know, in sort of complex level sensual experiences yes. through yes. architecture, right? Yep. Yep. And I mean, this isn't just wayfinding. Is, is right. It's not just, so the brain has some, people have done a lot of work on spatial navigation in the mm -hmm. brain, mm -hmm. going from rats all the way to humans. So yeah. there was this interesting study of taxi drivers in, in, in London, uh -huh. and they looked at the brain of taxi drivers versus you know, other non-taxi drivers and found that the area of the brain called the hippocampus yeah. that's responsible for a lot of the spatial navigation that we do yeah. is huge, right? It's actually very, very overcompensated for those taxi drivers. Right, 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 right. right, um, right. And so I think we can see those kinds of interesting you know, uh, correlates of brain function yeah. reflected you know, uh, as, a, as a consequence of the environment that we live in. Okay. Your brain's gonna be adapting. Okay. So a person who's, you know, so living... some parts of the brain are particularly developed for different things. Yes, yes, and and we are constantly, I think, also, you know, the, the brain is also, a lot of the memories that we have are always in terms of space or you know the, the locations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you imagine certain things, you'll also imagine being in a location. Right, right, right. right. So all that is encoded as part of our code. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. For our memories. Yes. Right? Uh, and so, in fact, I mean, a long time ago, uh, I think uh, people used to. Uh, you know, uh, I think I think back uh, in the medieval times, people used to memorize things by putting things in imagined locations. Right, 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 right. As a, right, as a right. way to remember things. Yeah, it's right? a mnemonic device. Yes, yes exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. architecture there was kind of being used as a way, you know, to spatially, uh, you know, structure. Yes, yeah, space content. is embedded in uh, in in the brain's way of thinking. Exactly. Right. The right. prefrontal cortex works uh -huh. spatially. Is, is that what you're well, saying? Well, that's one of the areas involved. Uh, there's hippocampus, yeah. which is also in a short-term memory and yeah. spatial navigation and so on. There's yeah. uh, parietal cortex, which is also in the central part, which is yeah. involved. In fact, our brain, uh, you know, the visual system parses visual information uh, into, uh, you know, these two so-called streams. Right. One is looking at content, which is, you know, okay, that's a cup, you know, that's another bottle, and that's a book, and so on. Right. But another pathway is looking at the spatial relationships between these objects. So, right. okay, there's something to the left of me, yeah. something ahead, you yeah. know, there's a vertical thing that's in front, and so yeah. on. Yeah. So, those kinds of, inf that kind of information is available to, uh, you know, the brain, right. uh, as we plan right. to make our movements. Right? Yeah, 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 so, yeah, those yeah. are really important features to have. 
So one is for recognition, the other might be more for you know planning and for actions and so on. So where where are, where are sort of more uh, emotional systems? Right. Those, so where do you feel beautiful? Right. Yes. Angry. Yeah. And so, so on. So those tend to be uh, what are uh, deeper structures and even older structures of the brain. Older um, and deeper like, structures. Yeah, so structures better. that are buried below the you know the the cortex, which is this big tissue that's uh, usually that's what you see when you look at a picture of the brain right, right that's yeah. the cerebral cortex yeah, yeah. Um, but as you go below that there's some older structures like the amygdala which is amygdala, yes. responsible for emotional you know yeah. expression and so on yeah. but those are not isolated they are interacting with yeah, the yeah, cortex yeah. and there's always you know interactions going on between yeah. the top and the other areas of the brain the, right. the cortex and other areas hippocampus also is connected yeah. uh, you know to the emotional centers right. so it's a very uh, dynamic system right uh, but uh, when you uh, art is really tricky because you know uh, some parts of art might be, you know, it doesn't appeal to the, the same to different people, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, some people might not like abstract art, others yeah. might uh, like, you know, uh, uh, surreal art and so on. Yeah. Uh, so basically you have different kinds of, you know, um, uh, emotions that are generated according to your own, uh, I guess, the model that you built for yourself, right? Right, right. Um, and so um, people have tried to do the neuroscience of art. It's still, I think, a very early stage um, in terms of what does it mean for something to be beautiful, right? Right? Is it symmetry? Yeah. Uh, I think there's a lot to be who learned. Knows, who knows? It's very complicated. It is complicated, yeah. So there is the neuroscience of architecture and then yes. there's the neuroscience of art. Art, yes. And there's connections between them, obviously, right? Yeah. Because uh, And all could, of these are connected by the neuroscience of desire. and Yes. 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 I mean, there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, motivation. So people look at what, what does it mean to be motivated to do certain things. So there's a whole structure called the basal ganglia that's involved yeah. in the kinds of, you know, behaviors that you learn and so on. So there's different areas of the brain that you can then start to study to understand some of these uh, interactions. So, so one thing I'm taking away from everything you're saying is it's all about how you train the brain. Yes, that's so key. So training is key. That's key, yes. So education is key, exposure yes. is key, repeated exactly. exposure is key. Yes. Correct? Yes, so basically we're born, you know, uh, with uh, the, the basic kind of structures, right? That, that's what... That's our genetic, sort of genetically evolved, you know, structure that we're born with. Right. But once you're born and you're in the environment, the brain's a, essentially a learning machine, right? Yeah, it's yeah, basically yeah. It just takes in all the information coming in, tries to make sense of it. Yeah. And uh, there's even this notion of a critical period, right? Which is that the early stages, you're laying the foundation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Just like a building, you're laying a foundation for what's going to be built on top later. Is that how it um, works? I mean, that yes. your early years are absolutely critical? They're critical because, I mean, that's a scene, for example, most clearly in language mm -hmm. learning. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. you know, sure. there's uh, some languages where there's some syllables that you won't even perceive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right? Yeah, so, yeah. for example, in, in Japan, uh, you know, uh, people might not perceive the word or even say the word ra, like, yeah. ra, like my name, Rajesh yeah. Rao. Yeah. I often hear Rajesh Lao. Right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, the yeah, ra yeah. gets ma mapped to a la. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And that's because, you know, they're born in an environment where there's no need or there's no uh, distinction between those kinds right, of syllables, right, right. right? And so the early years are very critical in laying the foundation. Okay, so but that's still a kind of a motor. I'm talking about, you know, they, they say in psychoanalysis that, uh -huh. uh, you know, whether you were breastfed or not is a critical thing in terms of how you relate to uh, yes. uh, uh -huh. human intimacy and things like that, right. you know, and these are sort of yeah. deep structures to your... Yes. to your uh, amygdala level. Yes, that's possible. I think, I mean, anything that, any kind of input you get, right, uh, from your mother, the smell of your, you know, environment, the, yeah. the, the smell of the people you're interacting with, yeah. the kind of food you're eating, you know, it could be uh, breastfeeding or bottled milk, whatever it is, all that is used uh, to shape, the, I mean, the brain is being shaped by all of that, right? And then, of course, and, But you know, what I'm asking is, are these sort of indelible marks or is this the brain constantly learning and adapting and it, changing. It is, so um, a lot of the brain is, uh, you know, uh, most, pretty much all of the brain you can say is, you know, devoted to learning, but there's some areas that are much more plastic, which is, you know, much more adaptable mm -hmm. than others. Uh, because but which are the parts which are unadaptable? This is what I want to know. So the, uh, the, the ones that are harder, I would say, to adapt <laughs> are the, the ones that were, you know, the lower level, quote unquote, lower level ones, which yeah. are, you know, things like, uh, 
uh, if you uh, look at, let's say, the visual cortex, right? Mm -hmm. In that, uh, there, if you go and study each of the cells that mm -hmm. are uh, there in the visual cortex, mm -hmm. the primary visual cortex, mm -hmm. they tend to respond to things like little bars, uh, edges, mm -hmm. uh, because like this particular bookcase is mm -hmm. composed of many, many vertical edges all aligned together. And there's many uh, books there, which are horizontal lines and vertical lines. Mm -hmm. So you can compose a scene with these building blocks, which are these little bricks, right, these mm -hmm. edges. Mm -hmm. So those were learned very early on, maybe even during evolution, because those were very fundamental to any kind of environment right. that the animal is born in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So most animals get born with this very low level kind of building blocks of yeah. cognition or visual, yeah, yeah. right? So then to change those, yeah. it would be difficult because right, you right. evolved to really have those, right. even though you can change the frequency in which these occur so maybe like they did some experiments where the kitten was placed in an environment where they only saw vertical lines yeah. and the kitten then pretty much lost the ability to perceive a horizontal line right uh -huh, for example uh -huh. so there is some uh, plasticity still left yeah. in the brain yeah. but it's restricted right yeah. but as you go to the higher levels that's where you start to form uh, skills learn skills memories yeah. right, right, facts yeah. right. you know, uh, uh, and things like that knowledge yeah. those are all you know very very open ended kind of areas right these are areas that can be shaped and reshaped over time uh, over over many many years and through your life right? i see yeah but you do need to have, you do need to have that foundation to build on right so so your memories of the early childhood are not uh, there uh, as much because you at that stage you were still probably building the foundation mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so any memories you had are all changed now because the foundation was still changing mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but once that's solidified then you can keep storing all the later memories and those are still there fresh I mean they're they're still there somewhere in the brain right um, and so th those can be shaped and adapted and so on so the brain is constantly you know this learning it's learning all the time essentially right um, and it is uh, one of the things that we've seen in our studies with these devices, right, mm -hmm. is that the brain can shape itself to control these devices, which evolution never imagined, right, that right. we'd be controlling. I mean, the brain was evolved to control our no, body. Evolution, yeah. Right? Evolution's it was going on right now. Yes. yes. And it, it evolved to control our body, right? Yeah. But then we have these tools, yeah. which are we're now using, right? Yeah. And eventually, you know, it, it, uh, the brain is so plastic or so adaptable that it can actually be used to control these very arbitrary kinds of devices like a robot that's sitting somewhere else or you know it could be used to control a cursor on a computer screen which is a very different kind of control mm -hmm, mm -hmm. than controlling a finger right uh, or controlling the muscles let's say right uh, of your body it could be a very kind of different way of controlling but it can learn mm -hmm. so it takes a while for it to learn but it can learn you know over many repetitions to control these devices right uh, so we're getting a window into learning also into plasticity in the brain through the research that we do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think you'll span uh, pretty much all of neuroscience. <laughs> uh, we're, we're just starting here, my friend. We are just starting. <laughs> this is sure. such, such Might a... have to come back many, many days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is such an amazing topic. I can imagine doing... 20 things but i want one more i want one sure, more sure. question before we turn to the indus valley sure, script yeah. you know i want to get your thoughts on you know complex emotion and complex behavior and ambiguity in the human mind mm -hmm. you know how do we sort of deal with the uh, unknown things and yet we deal with them right mm -hmm. we hold uh, yes. unformed ideas in our brain yes no that's a very crucial uh, question even for uh, you know artificial intelligence and yes. robotics right so yeah. there is a theory of the brain uh, called the the bayesian theory of the brain so yes bayesian you have brain. a book on bayesian yes. theory yes and so the idea with the bayesian brain is that you know we're uh, there's always going to be uncertainty mm -hmm. in what you perceive and what you, um, you know, uh, have knowledge of. Mm -hmm. And so the brain is built to handle that uncertainty. Right. And so uh, from a mathematician's point of view, you can think of it as a probability distribution. So you say, okay, you know, any, any kind of thing that you're perceiving or imagining 
there's going to be some kind of, uh, you know, think of it as a mean and a variance, right? There's some, some variance there, right? There's some amount of uncertainty there. Mm -hmm. And then the whole, you know, Bayesian viewpoint is that you're, you're, uh, when you receive new information, mm. you're combining it with your prior knowledge using Bayes' theorem, which is a mathematical theorem that shows how mm. do you combine the mm. probability of something coming in with what you already have in your mind, mm. right? And it's constantly doing that. It's always updating mm. uh, what it has uh, stored, what it has estimated so far mm -hmm. from everything it's received yeah. with the new information coming in. That's right. the whole Bayesian viewpoint. Yeah. And so uh, when you think about uh, the complex uh, you know, uh, kinds of phenomena, like how are we really uh, perceiving something that's really complex? So even even you know, the, uh, the visual scene that we take in, right? When yeah. you go into a room, yeah. it's very complex. Yeah, yeah. And computers are only now beginning to figure that out, right? Yeah, so yeah, AI yeah. only now is able to recognize and say, okay, that's a bookshelf, that's yeah, a computer, and so yeah, on yeah. in a room. Uh, but even then, it's got a lot of issues, yeah. right? Whereas the human brain can, you know, almost instantaneously recognize what the situation is. And, yeah. um, and so if you look at the architecture of the brain, yeah. what you see there is, you know, there's these divisions of labor, right? Yeah. Like I said, there's different locations. Yeah. Uh, so it, it might be, uh, you know, parceling information out into different kinds of factors. Yeah. So one might be, okay, these are all, you know, color aspects of the scene. These, this might be the location of objects in the scene. Here's mm -hmm. how objects are moving in the mm -hmm. scene and so on. So there's a little bit of that going on, mm -hmm. but there's also, uh, in many cases, a hierarchical structure. Uh -huh. So you, you divide things up into pieces, uh -huh. and then what you have then is uh, uh, building one on top of the other until you get to a very complex feature at the top, right? So you might start off by saying this room, mm -hmm. the, the image of this room is composed of just edges. Yeah, yeah. Everything is an edge. Yeah. But that's when you're looking at a very tiny piece yeah. any point in time. But you can string together many edges mm -hmm. and then form you know, a bookshelf. Right? Right, right. And then so on and so forth. And you yeah. can combine many books yeah. to form a whole bookshelf. Right? Yeah. And then you put many bookshelves together, put a chair and a table, and then you have an office. Right, right, right. right? And put many offices together, you have a building. Right, right, right. right. So it's a hierarchy, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we do see that in the brain also, yeah. where some areas, of, initial areas of the brain that receive uh, information tend to be very rudimentary, you know. Yeah, yeah. But as you go towards the so quote unquote top, the top the brain. is where prefrontal cortex. Uh, part of it, I mean, it, it, there's a motor hierarchy yeah. and there's a sensory hierarchy, right? Yeah. And they both sort of converge, yeah. and they're talking to each other also. Yeah, yeah. And then the hippocampus, which is where you form, you store some short-term memories. Yeah, yeah. It has very, very complex kind of representations. So yeah. it might be combining smell with touch with vision, all that combined. Yeah, right? yeah. And and it might be a very abstract representation of where you are in right, space, right, right, right. And what you're hearing, what you're feeling, and so on. Yeah, right? yeah. So there is that notion of a hierarchy. So I think we manage complexity partly yeah. through the architecture of the brain being evolved yeah. in such a way that there's modularity uh, and you're building on yeah. top of the existing functionality. Mm -hmm. And evo evolution does that, right? right. So it can uh, change a few genes here and there, you know, to have some mutations right. and then add another area, for example, right? Yeah. Or something similar to what it already has, yeah. but see what happens if it adds a little more functionality. Right. And if it's helpful for survival, then it preserves it right. in future generations. Right. Well, if it's uh, for survival or yeah. it's helpful for the human experience. Yeah. So it could be, you know, uh, whatever reason that evolution, whatever metric it used, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. It got propagated in well, generations. Well, last right. I heard, evolution uses error. Error and trial and error and mistake yes. and, you know, whatever. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's going to be a lot the of that Environment going is going to de 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 decide that. Yes, the environment plays a huge role. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's species that get extinct uh, in one location, but they must, the, the, they must survive in a different location, right? That's right. Um, so that happens all the time, right? Um, so that's the key. I think the key is that uh, the architecture of the brain is designed in such a way that, you know, it allows for complexity and ambiguity. It manages it, at least. It manages the uncertainty, manages the complexity. Uh, and that's the argument for interdisciplinarity. A university should work like a brain where there is all this, you know, yes. constant communication. Yep. Instead, we just sort of retreat into our own particular the silos. Am amygdala. And, and yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not how the brain works. I mean, there's yeah, yeah. constant. I mean, it used to be a very reductionist field, like yeah. neuroscience. Yeah. In some cases, still is, where yeah. everybody starts studying their own little uh, area of the brain. Yeah. Uh, but I think as a computer scientist and a computational neuroscientist, for me, yeah. I think at least I feel my duty is to look at what's happening and combine them in a holistic view of the brain. Right. Because that's where I think we get into these questions like, you know, awareness and consciousness and perception, all that. I mean, the way I look at it, architecture, you want to understand, you need to understand how the brain looks at the yes. space. 
Uh, we need yeah. to understand uh, neuroscience. It would be great. I mean, that would be, I, I think. I mean, this seems like a basic, and these seems to be like conversations yeah. one uh, should have. And yeah. then, you know, what is the thought of computation? Yeah. Uh, I instead, think it would give you lots yeah. of insights. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. I mean, yeah. I think, uh, because ultimately you're building structures for humans. Right. And humans Well, not ultimately, no. In part, we are building for yeah. humans, but we are building for the ecosystem. For the ecosystem, general. right? Yeah, uh, yeah. But then you also want to know how are humans reacting to that structure yeah, when they're yeah. living it's, in. It's, or it's a key thing. It's a key thing. And the brain is a window into that, right? And the brain so. is doing the processing. Yes. Brain is, brain is us living in there. <laughs> right. So you are doing it for the brain. <laughs> <laughs> ultimately, right? Now, one other thought that occurs to me, Rajesh, yes. is mm. this massive, like you said, uh, the Rajesh Lao example. Yes. <laughs> now that's simply at a you know sort of a phonetic level. Yes, but there are sort of deep cultural patterns, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and those are laid down deep early in life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, this is an argument also for cultural conservatism in one sense because you know, you know, uh, I grew up in sort of middle class North India in a certain kind of cultural intellectual. Milieu. Somebody else grows up in, you know, rural uh, Idaho. Yeah. They're gonna their sort of level of uh, baseline coding is going to be very different. Sure, definitely. And there's no changing it. So there is, you know, um, I don't, I wouldn't say no changing it. I think uh, it's possible to, um, you know, um, no drastically we could change it via surgery or something or or significant recording. Um, I think even edu education, right? I mean, education, as you said, is key. And if you if you cannot do it early on, um, let's say that, you know, you you are separate in high schools. You are in, you know, uh, one person is in, you know, rural Idaho. The other person is in, you know, rural India, right? Mm -hmm. Very different, you know, kinds of education and mm -hmm. cultural education. Mm. Um, it's possible, you know, at the level of college yeah. is when you have that dramatic transformation where you really uh, can have some alignment, right? If they go to similar types of universities, mm -hmm. uh, I think that's still possible. Mm. Now, if you go beyond that, beyond, so if they still did not go through that experience and now they're in their 50s, 60s, 70s, yeah. Yeah. I would say then it gets more difficult yeah, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but I still have some hope that, you know, uh, if they're open-minded enough to No, what really do you mean by open-minded? We are talking about the mind already. Yes, <laughs> open-minded in the sense that there's a voluntary, voluntary you know, um, Willingness. There's a willingness to, Rajesh, for example, take courses. The, all these words, voluntary, <laughs> don't have any meaning because <laughs> voluntary seems to suggest there's a sort of a blank subject. Uh -huh, You're right. saying subjectivity is all constituted through yes. coding of your neurons. It is. It is. It is. Yes. I mean, I'm saying that uh, you know, if uh, I wouldn't know, I wouldn't know how you would get a person, uh, you know, uh, who does not, you know, is, is not interested. Let's say, right? In in I'm talking about what themselves. is it to be interested. I am mm -hmm. interested in something. Yes. You're interested in something. Some yes. You are, are, or somebody else. Uh -huh. Our basic interests come from somewhere and they're now yep. deep coded. Yes. It's hard. It's hard. I think, I think it's uh, one way to do that would be, you know, a lot of people respond to uh, peers, right? So it might have to come through people that they trust. Uh, and it's a social interaction that I would know. encourage. Well, this, is, right? this is all you know. You're saying yeah. is uh, you know, this is this is our uh, received understanding of how to yes. change behavior. Yes, I mean, if you I'm want something pure brain science, <laughs> why? <laughs> I mean, dramatic interactions, mm -hmm. dramatic interventions. There would have to be you know things uh, where, yeah, there there are devices that they're interacting with, with which actually uh, cause changes in their brains, right? So, in fact, this is already happening with social media. Right, so these people are living in bubbles, for example, where they're looking at Facebook, yeah. and yeah, yeah. and that is an, a brain interface. Yeah. It's just an indirect one. Direct, uh, it's an indirect interface. It's yeah. not a direct interface. But when you interact with social media, you're reinforcing potentially like some of the conceptions that you have, preconce preconceived notions you have. My son lives in uh, not Minecraft. What's that new game called? Uh, uh, Fortnite. Fortnite, okay. <laughs> uh, so I, I'm thinking his brain is being wired into yes. Fortnite, uh, Fortnitely he has perceptions a, of the world. He has a very good model, internal model of Fortnite, essentially the world of Fortnite. Yeah. And then when he comes out of it, he has to essentially load the real model of the world, but then he probably has 
you know, some kind of intersection because the, the circuitry is actually the same circuitry being used, it's the same right? Circuitry. So he has to have, I mean, that's where the prefrontal cortex has to do the context switching, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Saying don't use the Fortnite, you know, model for this world. Yeah, yeah so I think it's, it's a very important uh, question in terms of, you know, what's, what happens when you have brains that are exposed to, you know, um, other kinds of worlds like uh, games, video games. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of evidence showing that there are uh, changes in the brain and the brain starts to adapt you know, to that environment, uh, because I mean, that's that's where there's a you know a goal-directed behavior going on. There's uh, there's rewards that you get right. if you perform better in that field. Um, and so I think there's a very interesting question about you know what's happening in terms of the brain real estate, right? Because there's yeah. only so many neurons only in your so brain. No, no, so, but what I'm saying is early on, yeah. you know, we were told stories. Uh -huh. You know, maybe we were told stories from the Ramayana and the yes. Mahabharata. Yes. Yes. And or we were what uh, Hamlog or we watched uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know whatever yeah. we watched right, right? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and right. the yeah. people are here that we watched the Brady Bunch or the, yes. you know yes. uh, so that deep level co somewhere or the other you're going to be coded in yes at that deep brain level y there's 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 some I mean there's definitely a lot of uh, that happening very early on and up to you know high school and so on, uh, it is who you are, right, yeah. at that extent. Yeah. But I think there's still some shaping going on after that, right, right. and there's still opportunities to shape yourself. I mean, yeah. there are examples of people who went back to college, you know, after they retired, and then, you know, I'm sure their personality has changed dramatically because they were exposed to people, you know, that they may not have been exposed to when they went to college the first time. Mm. Uh, so I think there are still opportunities for, you know, uh, re-educating yourself in some way and changing some personality, but as you said, it's very, it's, it's actually more and more difficult. Um, so we can still make you into an architect. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always open to try out new opportunities. I mean, I can bring the EUG cap and we can run it here. Yeah, yeah, let's and, do and, it. And let's we could, do we it. Could, we could do an experiment, right? I want to do experiments. Because totally we have a wireless EUG cap and we could do an architecture experiment. Well, let's you, do you know. it. Let's do it. When are we going to do it? Sure, if you have a good, uh, you know. In um, fall, I run a studio. Okay. On fashion and architecture. Okay. Yeah, maybe so, maybe as part of that, I could have one of my students come by with the EUG cap, and yes. you could. I mean, I think the, the 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 cool experiment there would be to, you know, uh, test different models, right, or different yeah. conceptions, and see what the reaction of the brain is of one yes. person yes, yes. to different kinds of constructions, right? Yeah, um, yeah. And then that would be part of the design process. Yes. Is you know the brain input. Brain right? input uh, to the design process. Yes, we should also put down the reviewers, the critics who yes. come, yes. and we really find out <laughs> what they think. You could. I mean, they, that could be part of their rating system. Part of the rating system, right? As, yes. Uh, not the subjective, but this quote unquote brain input could be more objective, right? <laughs> right, 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 right. All right. Well, we'll wait to see what we learn. Rajesh, thank you so much. For being oh, on you're architecture welcome. Talk. Yeah, I enjoyed it thoroughly, and thank you so much, you know, uh, for the opportunity to be on your absolutely, podcast. Absolutely, absolutely. So, thank you. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is Vikram Prakash, your host, and our producer is the one and only Sammy Prouty, a graduate student of architecture here at the University of Washington in Seattle. I hope you all enjoyed our conversation and if you did please do take a moment to subscribe and to rate us on iTunes. See you next time. Take care. Goodbye.